Hello guys, my name is Nash. Welcome to Thursday Tales of Terror. TTT. For today's case story, we will be talking about Hong Kong's very first gruesome serial killer. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Jazz Killer or the Jazz Murderer. He was also nicknamed as the Rainy Night Butcher because apparently for some reason, his attacks always happened when it was raining heavily. And the nickname the Jazz Killer was because he would cut out women's private parts and put them in Tupperware jars. Hence the nickname name. The crimes were considered to be so shocking and horrific that a female forensic scientist had to be taken off from the case and only men were allowed to serve in the jury. So are you ready for the story? Lam Kor Wan was born on 22nd May 1955 in Hong Kong. Lam Kor Wan's parents weren't married when he was born. His father, who was a Malaysian Chinese, worked in Brunei and he would visit them in Hong Kong whenever he was on leave. In 1957, when Lam Kor Wan was two, his father moved the family to Brunei to live with him and his mistress who was pregnant then. Obviously, Lam Kor Wan's mother was not happy with this new arrangement. Putting aside the fact that she had to live with her husband's mistress, she was also not happy with how Lam Kor Wan's father was being abusive. In fact, Lam Kor Wan's father had remarried a couple of times and there had been other children around in the family. But the abuse stopped after the family returned back to Hong Kong. Back in Hong Kong, the family lived in a very small apartment and Lam Kor Wan shared a room with his younger brother. They shared bunk beds, so Lam Kor Wan's younger brother would be on the top bunk while Lam Kor Wan himself would be on the lower bunk. They would each mind their own business, like you don't touch my things, I don't touch your things. That was the agreement to live in the room peacefully. Fully. As a child, Lam Kor Wan didn't have a great time growing up, he was often abused by his own father and he had to witness his mother being abused by his father too. At the age of 2, according to Lam Kor Wan's mother, Lam Kor Wan's father hit the boy's head against a wall. The head trauma was so severe that it resulted in two black eyes. Growing up, Lam Kor Wan lacked social skills. He didn't know how to make friends, he didn't know how to interact, he couldn't even connect with his teachers. After graduating, he tried out different jobs before eventually settling down on being a taxi driver. So in 1978, at the age of 23, Lam Kor Wan obtained his taxi driver's license and in 1980, he worked as a full-time night shift driver. Now let's talk more about his teenage years growing up. Lam Kor Wan in his teenage years began to explore his sexuality. He was fascinated by pornography. He would regularly purchase foreign pornographic magazines and keep in an ammunition box. But his interest in looking at porn magazines didn't last for very long and he wanted something more exciting. Now, too much exposure to porn can be damaging. Damaging in what ways? There are actually studies and surveys done on the topic of pornography and sexual violence and if there's a connection between the two. And they did find that the more men use pornography, the more likely they were to commit sexual violence. And that's because pornography usually shows the type of sex that's not usually the type of sex between consent individuals. It leans more towards violence, rough behaviours, rape, lack of consent and it's done so to appeal to men's sexual fantasies and it's said that it's not surprising that a man would seek to act it out at some point in time. But these are studies that I got to know and would just like to share. It is not my own opinion. I guess you can watch porn but maybe just moderately. Besides Lam Kor Wan's obsessions with pornography, he was also very interested in in photography. In 1973, at the age of 18, Lam Kor Wan bought himself a Polaroid camera and started taking pictures. But not just any pictures. He would sneak into public toilets and take pictures of women from under the toilet cubicle doors. And you know how huge a Polaroid camera is, so it was pretty obvious and he would often get caught and the ladies would chase him down the streets but he was lucky enough to get away each time. Eventually, he got arrested and charged with wounding robbery and indecent assault when he attempted to touch a girl's vagina. He claimed that he was interested in the female genitalia. During Lam Kor Wan's detainment, he was found to be having some mental health problems and he was deemed unfit for trial or punishment. He was then ordered to receive treatment at a mental institution and after staying for 102 days, he was discharged on medical grounds. On a Wednesday, February 3rd, 1982, it was raining and Lam Kor Wan picked up a female passenger at around 4 a.m. The woman named Chan Fong Lan had just ended her work at the Chinese Palace nightclub in Jim Sa Tsui. 
She had gone out for drinks with her sister and friends after work and she didn't want to hang out any longer. Probably tired, so she decided to head home. A few taxis had rejected her because she was too drunk but not Lam Kor Wan. It was raining and taxis were hard to come by when it rains. Because of this, Lam Kor Wan was able to cherry pick his customers and he chose this young woman staggering out of a nightclub which many drivers would have avoided because drunk customers are usually not easy to handle and they would puke in the car too. During the drive, she asked Lam Kor Wan to stop the car to let her puke. She opened the door and vomited on the sidewalk. She had too much to drink and wasn't feeling too well. Instead of continuing on to the original route that she had told Lam Kor Wan, she now asked him to take her back to Jim Sa Tsui, but after a few minutes, she changed her mind again. Now at this point, Lam Kor Wan snapped. He pulled over his taxi and strangled Chan Fong Lan with a piece of electric wire that he had with him. He drove home with the dead body still in his car, dragged it into his flat past the sleeping security guard and then hid the body underneath the sofa far in the living room. Apparently, weeks before, he had hidden himself in the same spot and he was confident that there was enough room for a body and the body would be well concealed. He took money out from her handbag and he went to buy himself an electric saw. He waited for his family to wake up and leave for work before he laid her body on his plastic covered bedroom floor where he used the electric saw that he bought to cut her body up. He even took photos of everything, the whole process. His interest in the female genitalia grew upon seeing it up close. He tried to cut out Chan Fong Lan's vagina and placed it in the Tupperware box filled with rice wine to preserve it. He cut up the rest of the body into seven parts. That night, he drove his taxi to the Xingman River and he disposed of the body parts there. 18 days later on the 21st of February 1982, her torso was found by a construction worker at a reclamation site. It was found stuffed in a bag. The woman's legs and arms were found separately along the Xingman River and her head was floating. The torso was later removed to the Kowloon Public Mortuary where it is to be examined by a pathologist. Lam Kowan on the other hand kept newspaper cuttings of it and put it together with his collection of photos. The public were extremely shocked by this news because Hong Kong was generally regarded as a safe city. The first kill made Lam Kowan feel very exhilarated very excited and very high. He wanted to do it again. Three months had passed and police were still unable to get any leads or information to who Chan Fong Lan's killer might be. After the first kill, Lam Kor Wan got serious. He made sure that he was ready this time round. He bought himself a pair of toy handcuffs, a knife which he kept next to the driver's seat in his taxi and plastic sheeting. On the 26th of May 1982, he visited the pharmacy in search of better tools for his next job. He told the pharmacist that he was a medical student and the pharmacist recommended for him to purchase a scalpel which is like a knife with a small sharp blade as used by surgeons and formaldehyde, a chemical liquid commonly used in preserving dead bodies. He wanted to preserve the parts he wanted to keep from his victims. It has become a collection for him him, a form of memory. Whenever I do something big, I want to remember it. It is a habit. I wrote in the calendar, Lam Kowan said. He had a calendar in which he wrote his own quotes for his killings. He called them actions, serious actions. On the 29th of May 1982, he marked in his calendar, action second. He continued to drive his taxi at night, watching and waiting for the right one. Chan Wan Kit, who was 31 years old, worked in a bar. It was the early hours of the morning and she had just ended her shift. She wanted to get home. She managed to get a taxi, Lam Kor Wan's taxi. Lam Kor Wan reached for his knife beside the driver's seat, turned around and threatened her. He handcuffed her in the back seat. He parked his car and used an electrical cord to strangle her to death. Just like what happened to Chan Fong Lan, Lam Kor Wan drove back to his apartment carried her body inside and hid her under the sofa. When the coast was clear, he moved the body into his bedroom and locked the door. He immediately set up his camera and his equipment and proceeded to work on the body. He took pictures and videos of the process as usual, but there was an accident. One of the lights equipment, a photographic lamp, fell onto the victim's body and scorched her inner thighs, and he took photograph of that. He took photograph of the scorch marks for some reason, and this particular photograph would play a role in him getting caught. 
Lam Kowan, who was still a virgin, started playing with the victim's body. He examined the victim's vagina close up and he groomed her pubic hair. And after that, he cut up her body into separate pieces, filming and photographing it as he went. He named the tape a serious secret. Now this time round, instead of using rice wine, he would be using formaldehyde. Lam Kowan reportedly bought gallons of formaldehyde and formaldehyde has an unpleasant smell to it. Some describe it as sort of like a chemical cleaning smell but it's definitely not a pleasant one. The family did wonder what the smell was and where was it coming from and they would ask Lam Kowan about it. He would use his photography staff as an excuse but they weren't 100% convinced and they kept on asking him and he got very aggressive and he told them not to interfere. So that's that. They didn't want to aggravate him any further seeing how angry he got. But I do wonder, if they had persisted, would things turn out differently? So Lam Kowan had hidden the body parts, some wrapped in plastic sheeting and others that were more interesting and what he deemed as valuable to him was stored in Tupperware with formaldehyde under his bed. Before his family got home from work, he moved the bag with the body parts to the boot of his taxi. Switching off his lights, he drove across the central tunnel arriving on Hong Kong Island. He headed towards a spot and dumped her body in a rice bag near Tai Hung Road. He continued to search for his third victim after this. On the 17th of June 1982, in the early hours, Lam Ko Wan struck again. This time round, it was 29 years old, Leong Sao Wan. Leong Sao Wan was similar to his previous previous victims. She had just ended her shift at the nightclub, it was after 3 a.m., it was a rainy night. She managed to flag down a taxi, Lam Kowan's taxi. He noticed that she wasn't drunk but just tired. Using the same methods as before, with more strength, he wrapped the electrical cord around her neck. He pulled tightly until she couldn't fight him anymore. This time, he set up his camera on the top bunk of the bed in the room that he shared with his younger brother. He set to work, carefully removing her vagina and placing it inside a jar filled with formaldehyde. Lam Ko Wan then proceeded to cut her stomach and remove her large intestine. He had wanted to eat it but according to statements, he didn't swallow the large intestine because he didn't like the taste. Just like what he had done before, he moved the bag with the body parts to the boot of his taxi and dumped it at the same place near Tai Hung Road on Hong Kong Island. His three victims were girls that work in the nightclub. He described the woman as useless to society. He continued on to search for something more. This time round, his victim was Leong Wai Sum. She was only 17 years old. She was the third child in a family of five. It was 9pm and she didn't want her mother to worry as it was getting late. She told her friends that she would head home first. She and her friends were celebrating graduation. She was different from Lam Kowan's previous victims. It wasn't late. She wasn't a bar girl. She wasn't drunk. She was just a student. She was described as pretty, had bright eyes and curvaceous body, and a spotless creamy complexion. That night, it was raining. She had just left a dinner party with her classmates in a hotel at Jim Sa Tsui. They put her in a taxi at 9pm to send her home, but she never made it back home because she so unfortunately boarded Lam Ko Wan's taxi. Instead of bringing her back to her estate, he turned into a quiet area and he told the girl not to worry. He told her that something was wrong with his tyres and he had to check them in a convenient location where his vehicles weren't obstruct. He went to the back seat and forcefully handcuffed the girl's wrist to the front seat. Lam Ko Wan looked at his watch. It was only 9.30pm. It was too early to do anything. Now Lam Ko Wan sat with her in the back seat and talked to her. He asked various questions. He asked about her family, what she was studying. He even searched through her handbag and asked her about every item he found. He asked her about her boyfriend and her sex life. This was the first time Lam Ko Wan talked to a girl this long. He was lonely and he sat there for hours and hours talking and maybe in his own way, he was also trying to flirt with her. He was in need of a friend. He actually liked this girl. Many believe that he was actually debating his next move. However, a few hours later, he strangled her. With this fourth victim, there wasn't much surgery going on. However, he had sex with the body and he filmed the process. This was his first time. It was clear that he was passionate about Leong Wai Sum and his desire for her lasted even after she died. She was special. She was the only victim that Lam Ko Wan actually had feelings for. And so he wanted to keep more of her. So he carefully removed her breast, 
one by one. And as he always did, he cut out her vagina and preserved his trophy in formaldehyde. He recorded everything on videotape and he dumped her body at the same location as his previous two victims. Lam Korwan documented his crimes. He had images of dismembered body parts, closed up shots of vagina and breast. Reportedly, investigators recovered more than a thousand photographs of Lam Korwan's victims during the different stages of his crimes. Now, Lam Korwan tried to get a Kodak store in Hong Kong to develop the films of his victims' dismembered bodies. Usually, the technician would check the quality of the prints. He was disturbed by what he saw, and he began questioning Lam Korwan. What am I looking at? Lam Korwan shrugged it off and said that he was a medical student, and he picked up the packet of photograph and left the store with a smile on his face. The most bizarre thing here was that Lam Ko Wan had his own home dark room where he was more than capable to process his own films and make prints, so why did he have to go down to a store when he knew it was a risk? In August 1982, yet again, Lam Kowan dropped two different films into two different Kodak stores for development. Initially, the technician who processed the film thought nothing of it as it's hard to tell what those pictures were, but when he realized some of the photos featured a pair of severed female breasts and a tie with a burn mark, he told his supervisor, who in turn contacted the police. It was the 17th of August 1982, and Lam Kowan returned to the Kodak store to collect his photograph but he was arrested by two plainclothes officers who had been waiting for him. Lam Korwan was taken to his taxi which was around the corner. The taxi had things like handcuffs, a lot of electrical wires, sacking and stuff like that in the boot. Even at that stage, the police had no idea what they were really dealing with. Lam Korwan initially claimed that the photograph did not belong to him but it belonged to his friend who apparently used his bedroom as a secret photography studio. But but of course, this lie didn't last for very long. Police officers, two homicide detectives, and Lam Kowan's family were crammed into his small flat and British forensic chemist Sheila Hamilton arrived a couple of hours later. Now, Lam Kowan lived in a very small apartment as mentioned before. He lived in a three-bedroom flat. It was a very small apartment. The bedrooms were so small that it's not much bigger than the cell, probably a hundred square foot. So when you enter Lam Kowan's bedroom, room, you will be confronted with a bunk bed. On the left side of the bed is a crowded bookshelf with lots of magazines and music albums. And underneath the bed, there was a large metal ammunition box. Inside that box though, was several Tupperware boxes sealed with masking tapes full of liquids and his pornographic stuff and photos. A detective opened one Tupperware and found a severed breast. Sheila Hamilton opened another Tupperware box and discovered a vagina pickled in formaldehyde. The evidence was considered too horrific for a woman to work with and she was taken off from the case. Now the room was so messy, the police had to take everything out and go through the room carefully and eventually they found the videotapes. Videotapes of his back facing the camera and what's in front of him appeared to be a lifeless female body. The police initially thought that the whole family was involved in these killings because it just seemed so impossible for one lone man to do everything. So they arrested Lam Kowan's father, Lam Kowan's brother and Lam Kowan himself. They were all kept in separate cells. The police had been interviewing the younger brother and at one point while the police was bringing the younger brother back to his cell room, he walked past Lam Ko Wan's cell room and he looked inside and he saw his brother there and he started lashing out at him. He started kicking and screaming and swearing at him, calling him a bastard and all. Lam Ko Wan's younger brother had to be restrained and dragged off. Lam Ko Wan was actually very affected by this. He was actually very upset about this but that's when he started to tell the police what was really going on. Lam Ko Wan didn't really need a lot of probing. He didn't spare any details. He was quite willing to explain everything. With this, the rest of Lam Kowan's family was set free. The family had wanted to sell their flat and moved out but because of how high profile this case was, no one wanted to purchase the unit. Hence, the family had no choice but to continue living in the crime scene for the rest of their lives. This case definitely attracted a great deal of media and public attention and people were honestly scared, especially ladies. They would not take taxis alone. They would make sure that they would have someone accompanying 
killing them. Now, due to the dismembering of the bodies as well as the months that had passed, the victims' bodies were unrecognizable. The fourth victim in particular was even harder. Her head was missing, not until it was found on Boxing Day. According to reports, two professors from the Prince Philip Dental Hospital devised an identification technique based on image superimposition which was used to identify the victims. They photographed the probable victims before doing an autopsy and took x-ray of the skulls, faces and teeth. Following that, they would superimpose the photos and x-ray to see whether they were identical. Now, when Lam Ko Wan went to trials for his crimes, Hong Kong officials considered the details too disturbing and upsetting for women to hear, so only men were allowed to serve on the jury. And so the trial began. Because Lam Ko Wan was abused by his father when he was a child, mental instability was used by the defense in an attempt to lessen his sentence. According to reports, Lam Ko Wan had told psychiatrist Dr. William Green that it was God who told him to kill the victims. But because of how brutal and disturbing this whole thing was, mental instability was not enough for him to get a lighter sentence. After 21 days of trial on the 8th of April 1983, the jury of seven men found Lam Kor Wan guilty of four counts of murder, and he received the death sentence that required him to be executed by hanging. However, Hong Kong abolished capital punishment after Lam Kor Wan's conviction, so the court changed his sentence to life imprisonment. He is currently serving his life sentence at the maximum security, Shik Pik prison. The case was so high profile that there were several movies filmed based on this story. Dr. Lam that came out in 1992 was one of the movies starring Simon Yam where the plot closely followed the accounts of this true story. And so we have come to an end to today's story. In my honest opinion, I'm just really surprised how he had managed to hide the body under the sofa without being discovered. And the family must have felt so creeped out upon knowing this, knowing that they were doing their usual routines at home like preparing for work without knowing that there's a dead body in the house. My hair just stood imagining it. It's truly sad for all four victims and I don't think I would be able to understand why he would even want to keep their private parts in jars and I don't think many people would understand either but this was truly a bizarre and gruesome serial killer. If you like my content and the way I tell stories, please do give me a like and subscribe to my channel. Let me know what are your thoughts. I upload videos every Thursday and I'll see you next Thursday with another story. If you want to find out more about today's case story, you can check out this podcast called Chasing Worms. It is a podcast that is dedicated to Hong Kong true crimes. I'll link the podcast down in the description box below. It's in three parts but it's very detailed and most of my information are from that podcast. And I'll see you next Thursday with another story. Bye!